Friggin' what up, dude? Um, it's Carter Wilson, and I'm the host of this podcast that's mine. It's gonna be called History is Nice. History is Frickin' what is up, my dudes? Dankatorians, dude. I want to use that more frequently now, dude. Danktorians. dank Dankatorians? What do you think? Historians? Danktorians. I think it's just Danktorians, right? Yeah. I think that's the move. Danktorians, dude. What is up? We got another fire-ass episode, dude. I'm your host, Strider Wilson, dude. Freaking what up? We got Aaron on the sticks, dude. What up, Aaron, dude? What up? Dude, just freaking chilling right now, dude. Dude, did a quick travel day, dude. Cruised around to freaking went to visit my dank ass fiance's grandma in freaking Cincinnati. Never been there, dude. Then I went to Indianapolis to see her brother, dude. So I was just cruising around the Midwest, dude. Freaking legit, dude. Nice trees, dude. Little fall foliage. Wonderful. I gotta say, I mean, honestly, I was driving around, listening to crushing fantasy podcasts, dude. Crushing Chad and uh, JT, go, going deep with Chad and JT, dude. Listening to myself talk, dude. Just really stroking my own ego while doing that, dude. And just being like, oh, dude, nice one, dude. Yeah, dude, my freaking, my list absolutely crushed it, dude. Aaron was probably wrong, dude. My top four definitely crushed it, dude. So just thinking that, dude. Um, Aaron, I mean, how are you feeling about your stance on that, by the way, dude? Are you sticking by your guns? I mean, uh... If anything, I'm I'm like tempted to go back and give it to JT. Really? Yeah. You'd like to hear yeah. You say that. Um, I mean, your list too. You know, strong. I, as much as I love Sandra Bullock, probably as a human being, I I don't dig her movies. What do you mean, dude? Speed to cruise control, bro? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> With Willem Dafoe, dude. That was like the first time I watched Willem Dafoe in that, and I was like, whoa, that guy's a villain. Remember that they like tried to give him something interesting where like he like put the leeches on his blood or something? He had like some deficiency. Yeah, yeah. Or like over, not deficiency, but like hyper, you know, m- too much iron in his blood or something. And he's like, I need the leeches to, to suck the iron out. He's in his bathtub just on a cruise ship. It's oh, hilarious, really, yeah. dude. Really bizarre. Great ass movie, dude. Great ass movie. Anyway, dude, fun, just cruising through the Midwest, dude. Beautiful weather, dude. Um, of course, you know, traveling, absolute nightmare. To completely sucked, dude. Luckily, I was just housing IPAs in the airport, dude, which was legit, dude. But, you know, because I was delayed four hours. I was gone for 72 hours. I did the math. I spent 20 hours in the in airports or, or in an airplane. Ugh. Unreal, dude. And that 70 is including the 20? It includes flights. Yeah, yeah, that that seventy two hours minus twenty of of travel time. Ugh, that's over a three day trip. So I don't want to moan, dude. I don't want to sit here and moan, but I'll tell you, nightmare, dude. And you know we live in LA. Shit's expensive here, dude. Airport prices, dude. Look out, dude. I got a, I got a chicken burrito. Guess what, dude? If I was an old guy, I'd tell you this. Hey, just come back from you know visiting the family in the Midwest. Guess how much a chicken burrito sets you back in the airport? Guess how much it sets you back? Guess what they got to have these days for a chicken burrito in the airport, Aaron? 16.50. Bro, you are absolutely on the fucking money, dude, because wow. I added guac so it was 19 bucks. Jesus. For a burrito, dude? Jesus. 19 bones for a burrito? What should be $7? Yeah, dude. 100%. And it's airport quality burrito. Not good. Ugh. Everything's a little bit worse in the like. You go to a Starbucks, same business, same whatever it is in the airport. A little bit worse. A little bit worse. Attitudes of everyone worse. You know. How about, really, just how about tough. The, how about the IPA? The IPA was tasty. Yeah, Not I feel like lie. I feel like alcohol in an airport has got to be better. It's nice. You get that IPA. In IPA and altitude, look out. Very nice. Very nice. They had to come on the warning system a few times. It is not okay to drink your own alcohol in the plane. It wasn't me doing it. It must have been some you know, young Jesus. kids on there bringing their own plane. I'm like, who's <laughs> raging? Who, who needs to get these scoldings, dude? But I don't think that's actually an FAA crime because they're like, you will be banned from flying on this airline in the future. So I don't think it's like an actual crime, unlike where like, you know, if you smoke, like tampering with a lavatory. Yeah, yeah. It's the only time I ever learned the word lavatory, dude, flying on a plane. It's where I also learned the words occupied and vacant, you know? Yeah. I was like, whoa, what are these words? 
So it's sick. Also, the only only place you drink ginger ale. Agreed. Or tomato juice. Why? These are things that I wonder. I still do. I I, I honestly do think it has something to do with the altitude. I think it like changes your um, senses a little bit. Maybe your um, endocrine system gets a little bit activated or something up there. The blood's thin or something like that, and that's what communicates, you know, your hormones and stuff. And um, probably something going on there. Um, But in any case, dude, travel, the ultimate educator, is it not? And you know what? I hope that you're traveling while listening to this dank-ass pod, dude. You're educating, you're traveling, commuting to work. Who knows what it is? Maybe you're a posting up on a plane. You've downloaded a few of these apps. And you're going to freaking straight up enjoy the one that I've got in store for you today, dude. But before we get to today's subject, dude, I want to first thank our sponsor, dude, American Giant, dude. They know the power of local, dude. So there's no place like home. We know I mentioned traveling, but this source is, dude, for their t-shirts that i'm wearing right now dude the pocket tee when i'm in the plane i put my shades in there dude it's legit dude the cell phone goes in there dude my little biscottis dude put them right in that pocket tee dude they got legit durable freaking like we just mentioned local fabrics made right here in the us of a la as a matter of fact dude and dude honestly don't fired up on the, the shirts right now dude but they've got the greatest hoodie i was posting up in that hoodie on the plane it was firing me up dude so go to american dad giant.com and use promo code dank for 20 percent off your order that's american-giant.com and use promo code dank for 20 percent off legit dude treat yourself dude freaking fire cheese dude all right dude today we're talking about the history of pigeon racing did you even know that they raced pigeons no near did i this was a suggestion my my first instinct is is just capital letters. How? Amen. <laughs> Amen. And I'm going to get into it. Um, dude, they're smart as hell, bro. They're no crows, dude. Crows are freaking super smart. They'll remember you. They know your face, dude. My boy freaking Evan hucking rocks at crows in the lot. Then the house does Jersey Mike's in a revenge plot. But, dude, pigeons are smart, too. They're smart, and they've got unbelievable senses, dude, because they, they know where their home is. And so, like, you heard of a homing pigeon, right? They know how to get home from anywhere, and they were used in battles and stuff, so we're going to get into that a little bit. Um, But first, just brief breakdown on pigeon racing. Quick overview right here, dude. Um, It began as a sport in Belgium, right, dude? In Belgium, bro, where they have freaking legit ales, dude. Not necessarily the best Ippas, dude, but the Belgian monks, dude, make some dank-ass ales, dude. Um, So in 1818, the first long-distance race of more than 100 miles was held, dude. Um, and so in 1820, a big race between Paris and Liege was a big one, dude. In 1823, London to Belgium, dude. So, you know, France, freaking um, England, and then Belgium, dude. Huge ass, really popular, dude. In the 1800s, it, it really took off in Great Britain, even in the United States. But uh, Belgium is really where the uh, it comes into, um, basically, the, the population loved it the most. And in fact, they had a um, Société Colombe Filet. And that's a pigeon fanciers club or um, virgins. So sorry, dude. Sorry to knock on that, dude. Sorry to call people who like pigeons virgins, dude. But, you know, you set yourself up. Whenever you have a passion that's niche, expect for me to call you a virgin, dude. You know, (laughs) just be just quick heads up on that, dude. And it's probably me paying it forward. Like, you know, I was into pogs when I was growing up, you know, and slammers. And I remember my big brother walked up to me and he do he says oh cool slammer it has a skull on it dude that that's sick let me look at that dude cool dude awesome i'm gonna go have sex with my girlfriend he was a senior in high school i was in fifth grade i was like that's tight i'm gonna try to collect more of these pogs you know and i don't think you know i think it's remiss of him to say that pogs and the amount of boning you're able to do is exactly correlated but one could say I was busying myself with those pogs and maybe could have been putting myself out there a little more. But then again, I was in fifth grade, so maybe you could have just laid off. But if you're an adult, dude, and you're super fired up on pigeons, you better be retired, dude. You better, you know, you better at least, you know, have a wife of a long, long time where you guys are now more friends than sexual partners. I get that trajectory. And that better be the case. If you're in your prime, if you're 24, dude, and you're into pigeons, 
I don't know, man. I don't know. In any case, dude, I'm fired up on the race. I'm fired up on it. Maybe, dude, maybe honestly it's a rush. You know, it's like horse racing. Maybe you got a gambling and you gamble on these puppies, dude. And maybe you, you lay down fat calls and maybe you do get laid if you're a pigeon. You know, maybe you've got a pigeon named like Homer, you know, and you, you have a good right relationship. And maybe you, you know, there's probably some ladies out there that fancy dudes that fancy pigeons. You know, there's a pot, the lid for every pot, they say, right, Aaron? So yeah. I think dudes who are into pigeons get laid. Maybe not as much as dudes who are into, you know, football and play it in any case dude um belgium dude it was going off bro so these pigeon fancier clubs dude were legit probably maybe they had sick ragers you know maybe they even had orgies that'd be sick um so there's the big annual belgian concourse national a race of about 470 miles dude so now we're stepping it up dude from toulouse to brussels uh, it was inaugurated in 1881 dude and um so it was just fire, dude. And the governing body is the Federation Colombophile International, dude. Um, it's got its headquarters in Brussels, dude. The stuff's still going on today. But, you know, it really picked up in the latter half of the uh, 19th century, as we're hearing. And before we get into exactly how a race goes down, um, just a brief history of the pigeon. Um, the first message-bearing pigeon was loosed by Noah. You know, so biblical account, dude. So it goes way, way back, dude. Straight up BC times, dude. Um, <clears throat> the ancient Romans uh, used pigeons for chariot races to tell owners how their entries had placed. So, you know, at the cause a chariot race, it would, you'd leave your field of vision, right? You'd go miles. Then you'd have another dude being like, yo, dude, freaking Maximus' is ch- chariot is much, you know, way, you know, out racing like Romulus's, dude, or something like that, dude. So pretty freaking legit that they'd use pigeons to send messages for sport so they were involved in race from the very beginning if not their own uh the great genghis khan established pigeon relay posts across asia and much of eastern europe charlemagne made pigeon racing the exclusive privilege of nobility dude kind of a schmoll move of him to be like sorry dude if if you don't have money dude you're not allowed to race pigeons um but honestly you probably you were a serf and you needed to be working so um, just un, unchill economic times, but just, uh, it was, I guess it was sophisticated. So I guess, Aaron, I guess I have to bite my tongue here and sort of sit in this high stool corrected. I bet you in Charlemagne times, um, if you were a good pib- pigeon racer, you probably got, you probably got some tail. I mean, ladies do love racers, right? But they're not actually doing the racing. <laughs> True. <laughs> True, but they're good with animals. There's something to be said about that. Sure. An animal responds well to you, right? In screenwriting, there's something called saving the cat, you know? Yeah. Have your hero. John Wick, he gets a nice puppy. The puppy loves yeah. him. It lets people know that this is a good person. These are pigeons, though. What if a pigeon shits on your forehead? You know, that's good luck, and, you know, it's... it's that's uh, That's really not a thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like telling a bride, yeah, rain on your wedding days... Uh, it's good luck. Yeah, exactly. It's trying to make a good thing out of a bad it, thing. Yeah, 100%. It's like, oh, don't worry. You spent $70,000 today and it's fucking raining now. It's good. It's, it's, you guys are going to be happy forever. Yikes. Yikes. Um. So the Ro- the Rothschild fortune is said to have been seriously augmented by pigeon-bearing news of British victory, dude. So may they probably made some stock moves based on that, dude. Um, Br- British victory at Waterloo there. Um, let's see. I don't want to talk about racing pigeons yet. Um, pigeons were used in wartime, obviously. Uh, they were used in the Civil War. They go back. Um, Ramses, in like 1200 BC in Egypt, he was using them as messenger pigeons to convey messages between cities, basically decrees that he wanted to rule. Um, like I mentioned, in, bad, in battle, you have the carrier pigeon. In World War One. they'd snipe them. You know, they'd cross. No one could cross over no man's land. You need to communicate with another company or something. And so snipers would just snipe pigeons, dude. But they'd be, they had to be fast. You'd release them all in a flock with the same message. Also, you know, you had to have code. Then someone would go out there to intercept the message. So just gnarly stuff going down, dude. Um, ships would use them, dude, to find a port. Uh, they'd, or, like, let the port know that they were going to arrive eminently. And they'd go, dude, cruise out. We're, you know, get the friggin' crack open the champagne. We're about to friggin' arrive, dude. Um, 
carrier pigeons were held in very high esteem in the Arab world, dude. They were called the kings of angels, dude. And um, so just friggin' beast, dude. I mean, I don't know why they were called that, but that sounds sick as hell. Nowadays, I think the pigeon has really fallen. I mean, I would probably say, Aaron, like, what's your bottom few birds? I mean, seagulls? Pigeons? I mean, these? pigeon's right. Pigeon is, pigeon's probably the bottom. I don't like birds much at all, mm-hmm. which is ironic because I'm a Cardinals fan. Yeah. But they're certainly tops. There are beautiful birds. I do I do understand, you know, bird watching is another activity where I would be inclined to call someone a virgin for being into. But, you know, birds are beautiful, dude. You watch those birds of paradise, their feathers, their displays, the dances they do. Very fun. Um, and it could be a fun trip, gets you out into the jungle. It's not too invasive. I think it'd be more fun spotting a bird than hunting. I mean, deep, deep down, I'm very soft. I don't think I have what it takes to take a bow and take down an elk. In fact, when I was in Indianapolis, my dank-ass fiance was meeting her uncle, and he had a bow, and he was talking about elk that he's taken down. And I was just like, I mean, you know, we're trying to relate. And I was like, man, that's so sick. I was like, it's it's sick that you, you know, using a gun seems pretty cheap. I was like, I like that you use a bow. And he, he agreed with me on that. Then, you know, he did even invite me on a hunting trip, and I was like, dude, I'd be no good for you out there. <laughs> and he goes, I just at least appreciate your honesty and that you wouldn't waste my time. Because he's like, I would try to get you a shot. And I'd be like, dude, I don't know if I have what it takes to take the shot. And based on that response, I think that's why he did put me on the air mattress that night <laughs> instead of the regular. <laughs> so I understand that. It's just hard to, it's hard. I love to anthropomorphize animals. I like mm-hmm. to make them human. I like to call them by human names. I Same. like to treat them as though they're human. They're doing human things. Mm-hmm. They have human thoughts. Mm-hmm. Hard to do with a bird. Same with a fish. Hard, Agreed. Hard to do. Much more difficult to do. Like I, I could, I'd much rather fish. I feel like a fish doesn't have a soul. It believes in no higher power. I have no problem killing and eating it. Um, also, you know, ignorance is bliss. I don't see how the cows are slaughtered or butchers. I'm sure if I did know more about that process, I wouldn't like it. It might be unappetizing. Yeah. Um, also, it's hilarious. Like people who call vegetarians wimps or something it's like no one hunts for their own meat it's like yeah. you just go one aisle over and buy the food <laughs> and like that makes me tough <laughs> that i go one aisle over and buy buy a steak instead of a, a row of an ear of corn it's like yeah. come on dude um maybe i'm just jealous of birds you know because they can harness the wind but there's something about a bird's eye Aaron. I, and i do understand that jealousy i do i do want to know what it feels like to fly yeah you know I would say maybe house a few IPAs and get on a plane and fly first class. That might be as close as you can get. Or bungee jumping. <laughs> but um, Hang gliding, perhaps. Yeah, bungee jumping naked might be real nice. Sure. Um, but I would say... But where do you tie the cords? But then, you know, it's another virgin activity. Like, dude, guys who are too into riding bikes on the street, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And then they all pull over and have espressos and croissants. Yeah. I want to punch all those guys. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm not even a violent guy. I can't even take a shot on an elk with a bow, which is the most respectable way to do it. But I want to I want to punch. I want to open hand slap all dudes that are into riding bikes on the street. Yeah. They're kind of like birds. They're very colorful. Yeah, they're aerodynamic. Yeah. They they go in flocks. Yep. They're a nuisance. Yeah. They make me say the very adult, adult word of nuisance. When I feel something's a nuisance, I don't like the way it makes me feel about me saying that. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to feel... It's like when I get a boner on the airplane. I don't want to have this boner. I don't have much legroom, even though it's a tiny one. I don't have much legroom, and I just want to sleep, yet I'm having a boner for no reason. You know what I mean? Yep. It's the same way when I feel like these adults who are into riding street bikes... I don't want to feel like they're a nuisance or be enraged and have the inclination and to hold myself back from open hand slapping. I imagine I would have a fantasy of open hand slapping like six or seven of them in one foul swoop (laughs) (laughs) and their helmets come off. (laughs) It would be so nice. And I have friends who are into it. Guys that I like. Yep. Guys who have kids. And I think they're going to be great fathers, but no one's perfect, Aaron. Yeah. No one is perfect. Yeah. The pigeon isn't perfect. But also I will say this about birds. They are evil. They have evil eyes. Like an emu or an ostrich. These are dinosaurs, dude. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. That's basically birds are dinosaurs. The, the dinosaurs had feathers and stuff. They don't quite look like 
Jurassic Park, you know, reptile dinosaurs like we imagined. Some of them might have had that, but it's more likely that raptors had feathers and stuff. Yeah. And so they're terrifying and they'll Because kill as you. you know, raptor means bird of prey. A bird 100% is a raptor. They're in a vulture, the difference between a raptor and a vulture is a vulture eats dead prey and a raptor hunts it. Mm-hmm. An eagle is a raptor. Yeah. A hawk is a raptor. A vulture or a turkey vulture is a vulture. It, and that's why it has the bald head because it gets bacteria and stuff from dead meat. So it has that bald head. The one indicator between a, a raptor and a vulture is feather on the head or not. Baby raptors and vultures don't have feathers on their head yet. They grow them later because of that very same reason, just to keep bacteria and everything out, limited infection. This was a nice tangent. Yep. I'm very fired up on this right now, Aaron. I mean, this is what a podcasting is all about. A casual conversation. We're all learning. We're all having fun. We're all talking about unwanted boners and having to hold back and restrain ourselves from violent um, delights. Yeah. I feel like my violent delight isn't too bad, though, Aaron. No, no. It's like a stooge slap. Yes. I yeah. want it to be more comical. It's open face. You know, it's not like I'm body gloving anyone no. like I used to do. You know what body gloving is? No. Yeah, I used to body glove kids in middle school when oh, I was a bully. Yeah. So you'd be changing in PE, and the prime time to get it was when someone had their shirt over their head, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that full extension. And so you'd go up and you'd go, you'd yell, body glove, boom, and then slap your friend right in the middle of the chest. Yeah, yeah. And the reason you did that is because there was a wetsuit company called Body Glove, and its symbol was a was hand, a hand, yeah. and it was in the middle of their chest. So, and, you know, we were all into, you know, we'd surf when we were younger and stuff, and I'd longboard and had a Body Glove wetsuit. And so you'd Body Glove each other. And I got Body Glove just as much as I would Body Glove, you know? For reference, viewers, um, watch any video by the band Living Color. The lead mm. singer wears body glove. <laughs> Does he really? Oh, yeah, he wears yeah, body dude. glove on stage. It's got to be horrible. Dude, and Living Color is great, man. They've got great songs. What's their one that... He, that, that guy's... Dude, his vocal range is pretty amazing. Yeah, Cult of Personality. Cult of Personality. Cult. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Also, remember playing that on Guitar Hero, dude. Yep. Legit, dude. Uh, spent a lot of time in my freshman year of college not having sex playing Guitar Hero. Uh, yeah. No, so just vulnerability there, honesty. But honestly, I could rip it. I could rip Dragon Slayer on fucking expert, dude. I spent most of my 30s alone in my apartment. Not most of my 30s. The early 30s uh, playing drums on Rock Band, yeah. I mean, that's sick as hell, dude. Yeah. It's fun as hell. Gaming's so sick. Whacking off in gaming, dude. My definition of making it in life is people are like, oh, Strider, you're pursuing comedy. Like, what do you want to do? Have your own show or a series or that? No, I want to whack off in game. Sans guilt. <laughs> That's it, dude. That's it. That's the pinnacle of life, dude. And then order a fucking personal pizza, dude. <laughs> <laughs> dude. If I could be eighth grade, if I could be an eighth grader with income, dude. Oh, look out, bro. <laughs> an eighth grader with a dental plan. Let's fucking go, dude. That's that's. Then you know you made it. Um. All right, dude. So, how exactly does a race work? A pigeon race. At the start of a race, competing birds are banned, or they're banded, right? So you know who they are. Uh, Then they are liberated, I like that, together by a starter who records the time of release. The birds ascend rapidly. They become oriented, means they find their direction, you know, using their freaking legit brains. Like I mentioned, they got smart-ass brains and senses. They harness the wind, and they head directly toward their lofts. So a big part of training, and we'll get into the, sort of the training a little bit, but you train these racing pigeons in their lofts. They know the sense of it. They know exactly how to get home. Um, it's like in the bird brain, migratory patterns, all that shit, dude. It's pretty amazing. Um, and then as the bird enters their home lofts, the band is removed from the leg and placed in a timing device that indicates the time of arrival. So the distance of the pigeon's flight is divided by the time consumed to, deter- to determine which pigeon has made the fastest speed. Now, here's the thing. A bird is not considered to have arrived home until actually through the trap of its loft. So it could be at the freaking area kind of dicking around. And so you need that pigeon not only to be fast, but also intelligent and precise and have the desire to get into that loft, dude. So um, it must cross through the trap door of its loft in order to be home. Um, pigeons have been known to fly several thousand miles in, in returning home, and some have attained average speeds of more than, what do you think, Aaron? How fast do you think these pigeons are cruising? 20 miles an hour? What'd you say? 20? 
Oh, no, 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 my friend. 90 miles per hour. 90? 145 kilometers. They're going 90 miles per hour, these pigeons. What? They're cruising. Bro, they would use them in battle times. They could, dude, they, they would cover 500-mile periods. Dude, they'd fly from, like, Cairo to Alexandria and shit in Egypt. Yeah, dude. I just assumed that took time, but... These things 90. are moving fast. Wow. Yeah. You could Dude, people would use it. tried. There was like, there was, a, I was reading a fun article that was like, in certain areas like of Alaska, not Alaska, why am I going to say that they couldn't, they wouldn't withstand that climate, but like in more remote, remote areas, carrier pigeons were used like in the 21st century. Then email was like standardized and they're like, okay, we're going to use emails. But like there were some areas where it was more efficient, like than the mail to just send a message by a carrier pigeon. And, you know, cabling and stuff and telegrams and maybe <clears throat> all of that was removed. So basically only ruled obsolete up until email. Uh, I mean, it's cool. I would like if these races. So what I'm imagining is like they take the home coop that they sent and set it up at like the end line in the city. You know what I mean? Or it's not like someone flies back to their house. Like people do gather for the events and they'll they'll start them all in one area. Um and then go back to their coops or whatever. So it's 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 pretty interesting. It's probably got to all be, I mean, I, I guess what, what that means is it's not like equitable distances to where their coops are located. That's why they divide the time or whatever, and it means they got there the fastest. So I guess a pigeon that maintains fastest average speed and has the intelligence to get in the loft door is going to end up winning the race, which I guess is something cool to talk about if you're into pigeon racing, dude, which is pretty freaking sick, dude. Um then this is interesting so just getting into breeding and stuff um you want the birds like you basically you can buy like stud ass pigeons like i was going online there was this dude and he's like oh yeah my my pigeons won like this many races um this is his offspring like he obviously doesn't want to give up his stud but he's like he's from this lineage so it's kind of like horse racing where you've got like a good blood lineage and then you want to like get that pigeon set them up with a female they need to like be together with like a lot of resources you give them like 25 to 50 percent more food than normal um they basically they chill like if you um and if they eat properly and they've been satiated then they'll get horny so it's just like dating dude like once they're once they have their food and then like you give them more rich minerals dude um so that like i guess like that'll like really bolster their uh, reproductive system or something like that. And once they're fed, the male and the female, sometimes they won't take a liking to each other, but odds are if they're both well-fed and chilling in the coop, um, that they'll bone, dude. So part of pigeon racing is is lovemaking, which really drew me to it, which is like, I like this, that there's the breeding aspect of it and sort of these studs who are good racers and have a good bloodline and passing that down, it's kind of tight. And there's dudes that are into breeding them dude and you know and, you, and there's like big successful um pigeon racing like factory like not like factories where they turn them out but like where they'll breed a lot at once using like really a pretty advanced science and and like uh dna testing to get the best racer but then you got to imagine if there's a movie here you know you're talking about some pigeon from you know it's got an injured wing at saint mark's square in venice some kid picks it up you know, while on vacation and his parents are like, now leave that pigeon and then get, let's get on the boat. And then he sneaks it on the boat, goes back to his home in Belgium, raises this pigeon and, you know, goes on to win the biggest race ever. I mean, I could see that being a movie, you know, he meets a girl that he loves. The pigeon meets a girl that it loves. It bones later on as adults, you know, this young boy will go on to marry that woman and, and, you know, they'll write a novel together, maybe move, into the north of Belgium, which I don't know, but I feel like that sounds like a romantic area of Belgium. And then they'll have their kids of their own. And then that kid will grow up to get into cryptocurrency and waste his father's fortune. I could see that being a nice, nice movie. Um, so basically, you have, like, if you set up a nice nest, you can buy stuff online, you get some good feed, and it only takes about, like, if you... It takes like about 15 days for them to actually get it on 95 percent chance of fertility um and then when they have their little they call them like um what do they call chicks you have their little chicks dude and then after about a year you separate them from the parents dude because naturally they have to 
they take flight, dude. You got to be uh, something about the legs. You got to be in, uh, careful, like when they're they have, like enough room, otherwise their legs will get too bowed out, and you want them to be aerodynamic for racing. Um, and then you know, about a year or something like that, you can really train them up to go on their flights. Really, just how to get them back in a coop and. Um, give them the good feed about, you know, 50% more protein and shit than you'd be giving a regular pigeon just gets from scraps on the streets or whatever and uh, be able to be okay with tons of shit all over your your um, coop or whatever, dude, which is unchill. And, I mean, that's pretty much the basis of, um, of pigeon racing, dude. Um, but first I want to get into something that traumatized me as a young boy or real quick before we get to questions um, about a book called... Um, Ringer by Jerry Spinelli in 1997, but um, before we get into into that, dude, I want to quickly give you a reminder, dude, that this podcast is freaking brought to you by American Giants, dude. American Giants, dude, has the most freaking legit fabrics, dude. I am absolutely fired up on these fabrics, dude. Um, Just super, super dank, dude. I'm spotting them right now, dude. Not going to lie to you, dude. Very fired up on these things, dude. Um, And, you know, I'm a history buff, dude. I'm, you know, and this shirt makes me feel buff. When I'm talking about history, it fits nice, dude. It gets right onto there, dude. It's got those homegrown freaking slub cotton materials, dude. It's got freaking legit color patterns, dude. And I don't like to take too many risks. I don't do the graphic tees, dude. I like a plain pocket tee, navy, gray, white. I wear it all the time, dude. In fact, I was wearing this shirt when I was talking to my fiance's uncle when he was talking about hunting. And he, I, th- I think he asked me about hunting because I was wearing this, dude. He's like, all right, that's a durable shirt, dude. That's something that you could get after it in, dude. And don't get me wrong, dude. I absolutely get after it in this t-shirt, but mainly throwing around dumbbells and, um, you know, mainly maybe doing a little bit of bird watching at my apartment or walking the dog, dude. Um, so fired up on this thing, dude. Fired up that it's, you know, homegrown, dude. The, the hoodie is absolutely legit dude i got the long sleeve tee too and we're getting to that weather out here in socal where it's time for a long sleeve tee and i can't wait to whip that puppy out dude and start sporting that pup around dude so just fired up dude um let's see they got dude it's it's basically it's a what american giants does dude it's just a pursuit of quality over anything else dude they give you a better product dude um it creates an opportunity to connect communities, dude. Like I mentioned, dude, homegrown cotton, dude. They're working with local distributors, dude, and and they're getting you that shirt. So, dude, when you buy this shirt, you're buying local. And I think, you know, especially in this era, it's nice to, you know, support companies and stuff that are, are right here at home, dude, and, you know, right here in the U.S. of A., dude. And honestly, for me, even straight up in L.A., dude. So I'm absolutely fired up on it, dude. Um, I wear it out. It's my freaking go-to shirt dude so sick dude um best quality honestly best freaking quality i've had dude on any and on any lid that i've ever worn dude and usually i refer to my lid as a hat dude but um in this case i'm referring to it as a shirt and so it's made me even do that it's made me upgrade my shirt which i haven't done for any other product to um hat status and as you know that's the main third piece that a bro wears is his hat mainly flat build and a little bit forward um i usually wear mine backwards I think it makes my traps look a little bit sicker and um, me giving the shirt lid status it's no joke and that's what this American Giants shirt does dude so go get yours dude you're going to be fired up dude buy a few of them because you're going to be you're going to get get yourself the arsenal as I like to call it get the white get the blue get the gray and you're going to be freaking stoked all freaking day dude so explore American Giants collection with durable essentials at American-Giant.com and you get 20% off when you use code DANK at checkout that's 20% off at American-Giant.com promo code DANK treat yourself dude all right, dude. So, this book that I read as a kid, dude, it's called Ringer. You ever read that book, Aaron? No. Jerry Spinelli? No, no. It doesn't exactly have to do with pigeon racing. And it sort of made me think of it, and maybe this is where the influence from my hypothetical film for the boy who finds the injured pigeon in St. Mark's Square, Venice, um, is this dude, this kid named Palmer, dude, he grows up in a small town, and they have too many pigeons in that town and every year this town has a festival where they straight up shoot the pigeons and then when the pigeons are downed once you turn 10 as a young boy you get the privilege of going out there and wringing the pigeon's neck 
And this kid Palmer, of course, like myself, he's kind of soft. And, you know, he'd be referred to in the heteronormative term as soft. And, you know, my guilty term as a virgin, which he's 10, so hopefully he is. And he falls in love with a little pigeon. So his story gets even more difficult, and he's dreading the time where it comes up in this town where pigeons are a nuisance. You know, people are, they say when they shoot a pigeon, good riddance in this town, dude. And young Palmer, dude, good-hearted boy in a violent town, dude. And he's got to deal with the fear of growing up, and he's got to deal with the fear of loving something that bullies, like his bullies in this book are named Beans, Mudo, and Henry. If you ask me, are three and excuse me, little motherfuckers who keep picking on on Palmer, dude, for just being himself, dude, and that's not chill. So a lot of great themes, dude, but it was a tough read for me as a kid. I was stressed out, dude, um, and he doesn't want to wring the pigeon's neck, and it, doesn't, and it just really doesn't want to make me grow up, you know, and that's really what it is. Um, but he's got to come to terms with ending life, preserving life, stepping up for what he believes in, and um, how he deals with, with death. Heavy themes, dude. I read that when I was like 10. Dude. Still think about it to this day, dude. He also meets a, a young lady named Dorothy, dude, who you know they're going to grow up and just freaking be boyfriend and girlfriend. It's going to be legit. Interesting, dude. Weird in, in books and in television and film. Like, did you like Stranger Things? Yeah. Loved it. I love Stranger Things too, but it's weird when little kids have like l- love interests. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. Well, I in mean, film and tele- I mean, we all have been there. We all yeah, like. Yeah, we all lived it. But yeah, it's weird to watch it. It is weird to watch. Like, I don't need to see that. It's even weirder when like they cast a hot high schooler. You know? Like yeah. I talked about this, dude. When I was younger, I saw the Little Giants. Great movie. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Devin Sawa, dude, plays Junior. And I was like, even as a kid, I was like, Devin Sawa is a hot dude. You know what I mean? I was like, that's a sexy ass kid. Yeah. But then now as an adult, I have to look back and go, some adult casted Devin Sawa and was like, this is a sexy kid. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that unbelievable, dude? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a weird part of life. It's like, you got to pick a good looking kid to play this part. I know, dude. But like, what does that make you? I don't know. It's kind of like a dude who acknowledges another dude's handsome. It's like, well, I'm not interested in him, but I can acknowledge he's handsome. I uh, I get fired up and appreciate handsomeness. Yeah. It's like, it's artistic to me. It's beautiful, you know? Some people are works of art, you know? And it's just an interesting thing, dude. I don't know, dude. But in any case, dude, pigeon racing's legit, dude. If you get into it, dude, move to Belgium. It could be freaking sick. Go to Brussels, dude. Get yourself a nice homing pigeon. Oh, I did want to talk about this real quick, about the descendants um, of pigeons that are used today in racing, dude. They are... Racing pigeons are descended from the rock dove, dude. And that was the one that Ramsey's used. He was using um, messenger pigeons, but mainly rock doves. And so the the homing pigeon that we have today is a... um, That's its ancestor, dude. So like we talked about, you know, sick-ass eagles and hawks our ancestors its ancestors would be raptors and shit dude um rock doves were the homing pigeons ancestors which is pretty tight dude they were postmen dude pigeons dude they were soldiers pretty pretty legit dude and now they're racers dude if the racers if the if the the breeders and keepers and owners of the pigeons aren't getting laid at least we know the pigeons themselves are and that's sick as hell to me dude let's take a few cues then bone out dude um, Strider, what up, dude? Am I too hard on myself, or am I just a bitch for asking this question? Noah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, dude, I think I got to say, I mean, just the phrasing of that question, I think you're being a little too hard on yourself, dude. It's okay. I truly believe there's no such thing as a stupid question, dude. You got to ask questions. You know what I mean? If you if you repeat a question twice, you know, listen better, but it doesn't mean the question's dumb. It means you you need to listen better. But, um, nah, dude, you're not a freaking bitch, dude. Um, you're being hard on yourself, bro. It's good. Hold yourself to a high standard, but be okay knowing that you're going to have failure before success. You're not going to be great at something your first time around. Some people are, and that's great for them. 
but 99% of us aren't, and it takes work to get better, and the work is where um, satisfaction comes in, dude. There's nothing like, you know, putting yourself out there, putting in the effort, putting in the hours, and, and then succeeding in the end, you know? But every every everything strong as oak starts out as a little nut, dude. So... <laughs> Um, what up, Strider? The dank king of the stick and king of the sticks, Aaron. What? Up? Oh, I love that, dude. King of the sticks. I'll take it. That's freaking dank, dude. That's dank. I'm 35, successful-ish, career-driven. Have dank hobbies like racing motorcycles, mountain biking, and working on cars slash the house. Yet I'm still single and cannot lock anything down from the apps. As a result, I'll be on Warzone later and wanted to know if you wanted to get some dubs. I'm busy on the comms and good with callouts. Thought I was going to write in with the relationship cues, but I'll probably figure it out eventually. <laughs> Hilarious, dude. <laughs> That's amazing, dude. So he just he just wrote in and wants to freaking drop. Um, he gave me his gamer tag. I won't share it in case, you know, maybe people don't want to reach out. Um, all right, dude. I think I'll be dropping later, bro. So I, I drop pretty frequently. I've been out of town, so I am itching to get on the sticks. So I'll keep my eyes peeled, dude. I would sometimes do appear as offline because um, admittedly one of our bros is kind of too demanding on the sticks and gives too many orders. And then also when he's dead and gulagged and got killed, when he's watching you play, when he's um, spectating you, he tells you exactly what move to make. And you're like, bro, just let me play the game. I'm going to try to get you back, dude. So uh, I've had to go on, on ghost mode for a while, but maybe I'll come off ghost and we'll get some drops. But now that I have your tag... I can reach straight out to you and still stay on ghost mode. So thank you, my dog, Alex from Portland, dude. Um, he did put in an alternate question, though, dude. She said, should my online profile look m look more like a dirt bag? And then he put in parentheses, women like my look. Or should I look preppy since I'm looking for stability long term? Interesting question. So he's saying what he puts forth in his look, is that going to attract? Yeah. I think so. 100%. Right? I think like yeah. if you like... If you put yourself, like, if you have, like, a fat plume of vape smoke and you're wearing a leather jacket with no shirt underneath and you're sagging your pants with no underwear on just to show, like, right above your dong line, you're basically the road to your dode, you might attract someone who's maybe not looking for something long-term, but maybe you will find something long-term. Um, I would say be yourself is number one. So whether that's preppy or this look, I say, I would say when it comes to the apps, and if you are looking for something long-term... Don't go for manufacturing something. Just wear what you'd normally wear. For me, that would probably be like plaid board shorts and a sick-ass Volcom shirt and maybe a beanie. So, and, you know, maybe I'd find someone freaking sick. But, you know, luckily for me, I got my dank-ass fiancé. So I'm not on the apps, but I think, you know, being yourself. I, I would say candid pictures are fun that you've taken with night outs with friends, something like that. Yep, sure. Um but if you do want to be edgy, I would say pose with large reptiles, go to an alligator farm or a snake, <laughs> have something like that. And maybe pose with a pigeon, dude. And, you know, you'll get some comments. What is that? Why are you posing with a pigeon? Oh, I race them. Whoa. Can I come to a race? So maybe after all, that's something that we've learned. We've come full circle now. Maybe you can, you know, meet someone on the apps. And then, but yeah, I think, I think what you put forth, I think people... You know, it matters what you wear. We do, unfortunately, as people, and maybe fortunately, sometimes judge books by their covers. What do you think, Aaron? I think definitely, it definitely matters. Uh, if you're looking for something more long-term, I think you should have more conservative photos, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're holding a Trump flag? No. Uh, yeah. No, but like, you know, like I, I went with, I know I had a, a photo of me in a suit, like, yeah. That was, I think, my first profile photo on, on a dating app. So, Perfect. You know, that always, almost always works for guys. So, but then also, you know, sprinkle in some other stuff, your, your regular, regular attire and, and, but like you said, be yourself. I mean, don't be, Yeah, you don't want to put off that you're always wearing a suit because that would be disingenuous if that's not what you do. A hundred percent. For me, it would be, I'd probably, if I, if I was a single guy on an app, it'd be me probably cleaning my paintball gun then it would probably be me i would pro i probably would definitely be posing with some sort of large cat or um a, a big cat if you will um up close with some sort of animal i think that would be sick as hell 
Um, maybe honestly going to one of those places where like you can hold and, and you can like summon a falcon and I would have a falcon that's been summoned onto my arm and that'd be fucking sick. Um, then I would have one that's just me in a suit. That's a good call. Maybe a seersucker suit holding a freaking mint julep. Maybe at a wedding or something. I would have to hopefully be friends with someone from the South and, you know, score an invite to that. And then the other two maybe would be me jumping, doing something athletic, maybe lifting a weight, maybe doing a hand clean and snatch. Um, and then the last one would be me with probably my fucking boys. So something like that. Um, let's see here. Yeah, keep it loose. Don't 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 take it too seriously either. Yeah, dude, have some fun, bro. Yeah. You know, like like you know, get, go circling back to what Noah wrote in, dude. Don't don't be so hard on yourself. Be okay failing. Yeah. It's it's you know what another great term word for failing is? Experience. Yeah. Exactly. Go out there and get it. Um, let's do one more and then bone out, dude. Strider, what up? I lift weights and wear tight clothes, but I want to feel sexy for myself. Interesting. I feel like I'm doing those the things that I'm doing are for others. Chris. Huh. Interesting. Not really a question, but I do understand what he's saying. He's saying, I mean, I think it's good. I think in turn, you know, exercising, lifting weights, you are doing that for yourself. You're taking care of your body, but I would understand what you mean. Maybe he's doing the beach bod workout, calves, pecs, buys, and he wants to do something that's, makes him feel sexy for being him i mean i have a sweater that i wear sometimes and when i wear it I, it makes my shoulders look a little more jacked and i know that's outward image but also it's like when i wear that sweater i feel sexy in it you know what i mean um i mean i think that's important i do i think I think honestly what can make you feel what at least makes me feel sexy like think about how men these days excuse me these days um sort of display or peacock if you will to stick with our bird analogy here right so what do they do the waist display tip heavy drive a car that's really really nice and that's all outward what can what can you do inward to make you feel sexy and you know what I think dude having your boys backs Go, playing, doing activities, dude. I love it. Going and playing pickup basketball, dude. The fact that Aaron's on a softball team, that's sexy to, to me. He's, well, I would say the trick is doing something that's fun for you and that you're into genuinely, even pigeon racing, is sexy because you're into it and it makes you you. And there's nothing sexier than that. What are your, what are your thoughts, Aaron? What can he do to make himself feel sexy without, you know, sort of displaying it for others you know i mean you know just stand in front of a mirror a lot right <laughs> that's a good call too <laughs> i don't know like it is uh, it is odd like to feel like you're doing it for other people it's like i, I don't know I, if i were to work out that hard i would feel like it was for me inst instantaneously so i don't i don't really know yeah it's an interesting mindset i mean i would say Maybe he's just being hard on himself. I mean, yeah. like, Am I only doing this for other people? It's like, no, dude, you, you want to feel good about you too. And that's yeah. okay, bro. You know, you, you can borderline on vanity and whatever and posing too much. Everyone makes fun of the guy that's just looking at himself in the gym too much. But reward yourself with the views. You know, maybe have a little bit of self-awareness with when you do it. But yeah, if my freaking horseshoe tricep, which is right here that I'm showing right now, that looks like a motherfucking Clydesdale, one of those Budweiser horses stepped on it. Yeah, bro, I'm going to let people see it. You know, I want to, you earned it. Enjoy the fruits of your labor. You know what I mean? Do so humbly. You know, I'm not, I didn't do that so humbly, but you know, it's fucking sick. So I think just get after it, dude. Do stuff that you're passionate about and be fun and take it easy on you. You know what I'm saying? Other than that, dude, I was sick. I didn't even know that pigeons were raced. I didn't even know Belgium was a hot spot for it. Fired up on homing pigeons, fired up on rock doves, dude. Um, you know who's super into it? Who? Mike Tyson. Pigeon racing? Yeah. That's amazing. I think he raised them for a while. Yeah, okay, that, I feel like that's really what it comes into is like, at least in my research, is like breeding and raising, and it's it's more akin to horse racing, like having a trainer and raising them. Like It's like one dude doing it on his own who's really into the whole process. Um, it's not like you go buy a fast bird and then just show up at the race and be like, let me watch him run. Yeah. Um, it's really the whole effort and everything 
and it's sort of beautiful. And it so. doesn't seem like any birds really get harmed doing it. It's kind of chill. Yeah, see, that's I'd ra- I prefer that. Let's do some pigeon fighting. Pigeon fighting? <laughs> Dude, I'm sure some of them do get after it a little bit. I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure they're dirty out there. Yeah. Going 90. Yeah, they're going 90 miles an hour, dude. Get they're a little, get a little in there, like, um, like in that road race at the end of Greece. Mm-hmm. You know, get in there with your, with your spiky. Uh, we're pl- we're racing for pink slips. slips. Yeah. The rules are there are no rules. Exactly. That guy, dude, tough looking, 35 year old teenager, <laughs> dude. <laughs> yeah. So with funny, acne, dude. Super acne scar. <laughs> you totally do. Like this guy, dude, is so old. <laughs> Dude, you know how you know, like when a hawk is dive bombing on prey, or an eagle. I'm sure like a bigger bird reaches yeah. a, a higher speed. But do you know how oh, fast yeah. they're bombing towards Earth? Like 200 miles an hour. Yeah, it's like 200. Yeah. And when they're boning too, and they're consummating the bond, and they will keep going until oh, consummated. Yeah. They'll hit the Earth and die before they don't get their nut. And I love that. I feel that. I feel that right. That's what's soul. up, dude. Yeah. That's what's up. So that is what up, dude. So thank you guys for listening, dude. Danktorians, bro. Um, fired up on another ep, dude. Pigeon racing, dude. Question, comments, concerns. Freaking Strider Wilson Shreds at Gmail. Um, Strider Wilson Shreds at gmail.com, dude. Hopefully you don't have any concerns, dude. Aaron is a beast as always, dude. Aaron, king of the sticks, dude. Thank you, dude. I've been your host, Strider Wilson, dude. We'll catch you on the next one, dude. Freaking late, dude.